So the question is, uh, what are the causes and the decline in performance under heat stress? So uh, there's a number of them, but the major one is gonna be really, it's the loss of fluid levels and electrolytes. So part of that is going to result in some issues with your electrical chemical balance between your cells because we sweat out so many of those electrolytes, sodium, chloride, potassium, magnesium, and a couple other minerals to a certain extent, which in turn is going to make it harder effectively to utilize our muscle. Since we're losing body fluid, remember we've got cardiovascular drift, which makes it harder for our aerobic system to keep up that performance. And then of course, you know, we've got the additional fact of now as we don't have enough fluids and electrolytes inside of our body, now our nervous system isn't gonna be functioning as optimally. We're going to not be able to effectively utilize, utilize our muscles as well. And once body temperatures get to be certain levels, enzymes in the body start to no longer function like they're supposed to, which is going to cause a lot of other declines in performance neurologically and obviously muscular skeletally. So uh, does that answer your question, Holly? Awesome. Yes, how can I help? Sorry, I'm going to enjoy a little bit more lunch while I'm waiting to see the question in the chat. No, I was going to do the critical power lab this week. The gymware power maintenance lab, we'll do that uh, in a future. Or sorry, in the future, we're not going to worry about that uh, too much right now. So every, just figure each lab is getting pushed back a week. Yes, I will change the due dates in Blackboard. Yeah, don't worry about it. Uh, yes, you can do the critical power test on a resistance bike, where effectively the idea is you're going to pedal against a near maximal or just pretty high resistance for three minutes all out and whatever wattage you have averaging for the final 30 seconds is a pretty good indicator of what your aerobic capacity is. Otherwise, we are, or you can go ahead and do it on something like an Airdyne if you want another option of how you can be aerobically miserable, uh, but get an idea of what is your greatest possible performance. So questions, comments, concerns? All right, give me one second. I'm just gonna close the office door so I can take off the mask. I'm gonna, I'm gonna close it. Oh, thanks, bud. Yeah. So ergogenic aids. What we're really talking about is anything, and ergogenic is something that's going to be increasing your ability to do work. Now, when we think about ergogenic aids, we're often thinking about things like, oh, taking drugs. But in reality, using something like a lifting belt, when you're obviously going to be lifting weights, that is an ergogenic aid. Using knee wraps, knee sleeves, squat suits, etc. all those are going to be different things that are going to be ergogenic. The key is obviously what's the barrier to entry, how expensive are these things, and potentially how dangerous can they be with your performance. So we're going to focus a lot on pharmaceutical versions of it. Now, obviously, there's a lot of different things we can take as far as drugs, hormonal agents. So now we're talking about testosterone, growth hormone, et cetera, physiological agents, and then nutritional agents. So really, it's going to be things we're going to be taking orally, injecting, or that's really your kind of, yeah, these trends are, well, there's so many different ways you can take a lot of these drugs. It just kind of comes down to what we're trying to accomplish. So ergogenic, something that's going to go ahead and increase our ability to do work. Ergolytic is something that's actually going to cause us to do less work. So like anything else, we can take certain drugs, which will help our performance in certain areas, but will take away from our performance in others. Now, when we think about a ergolytic, this would be typically alcohol. It's gonna decrease your, especially when it comes to cognition and neurologically demanding tasks. Now, does it allow you to perhaps have a decent, uh, decreased sensation of pain um, and not as great ability to, to effectively do risk assessments? Yes, very much so. So, and that's where some folks might 
try to abuse it or just to escape reality because, you know, it could be a little bit much for some folks uh, for considerably large amounts of time. Now, when it comes to ergogenic aids, we're really looking for something that has been shown to have major effects on performance. Now, there's a lot of things out there that people are gonna make compl or compl claims about that are actually gonna be increasing their performance. Whereas what you have to be very mindful of is what's known as the placebo effect. And that is where you neurologically are convincing yourself that this thing is having an effect when in reality, it's not having any effect on your body. Instead, what we're looking at is our own psychology convincing us that it works. So, and this is one of the greatest, uh, or one of my favorite studies when it comes to the examples of utilizing uh, the placebo effect, which is we trick ourselves into thinking that something works. Now, these individuals went through seven weeks of hard training. Now, the ones that made the greatest amount of progress on these four lifts, so squat, sitting press, military press, and bench press, they were then put into a next four week trial where they were told they were given oral anabolics and continue to train. And they made even greater progress in those next four weeks than they made in the initial seven. Now, what this tells you, and because once you can see right there, it says placebo, these folks now trained harder, worked harder, and essentially were convincing themselves that they were in fact on drugs. And because of that, turns out they were making a lot more improvement than the individuals that thought obviously they were just training based on their own. Now, the flip side you need to be careful of is what's known as the nocebo effect. And this is something that a lot of people that you meet every single day of your life are unfortunately falling prey to, which is they talk themselves into thinking they can't do something. So it, when people say, oh, I'm not good at blank. Well, really? Have you really tried that hard? Have you put in that much effort? Is that really a good estimate of your actual capabilities or instead are we just approaching life with a fixed mindset and or you've had a coach teacher otherwise that said you were bad at something and because of that once again it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that well I'm just bad at this and that's why I don't make progress in reality this is just you know unfortunately fraudulent thinking but it becomes the massive rate limiter on what would otherwise allow people to make hopefully some sizable improvements on their life now Obviously, the science might not be always the clearest because it turns out we haven't done a lot of good research on the use of anabolics. We definitely got a pretty good idea that it works, but as far as like a lot of good double-blind peer-reviewed studies, there's not a lot out of them. Now, like anything else, it can be very difficult because if you're just using a substance that increases your performance one or two percent, well, it turns out you might not obviously be able to detect that when we're working with untrained individuals. And elite athletes are not gonna be signing up to do research studies because their coaches would never let them. Instead, they're trying to effectively do as well as they can. And yes, they're gonna talk amongst one another and utilize whatever substances they can to the best of their ability to increase their performance. So the World Anti-Doping Code is effectively anything that has the ability to increase performance, but also has the ability to harm the individual that violates the spirit of the sport, which is kind of funny because it turns out there's a number of things in performance that allow you to increase your potential that also increase your risk of injury. A simple example of this is cleats. If you were to try to run and play every sport you play barefoot, it's very difficult to tear your ACL because you're not going to have a high enough coefficient of friction most of the time between you and grass much less you in a wood floor. So you're just going to spin and fall over or slip and fall well before you're gonna tear something off. But when it comes to utilizing, obviously pharmacological agents and otherwise, now we're getting ourselves into a different logical conundrum. So if you're working with obviously any type of athletes, yes, there can be a number of therapeutic exemptions for a number of different drugs that individuals can use. Otherwise, obviously, if they're caught utilizing these substances and then from there, they tend to lose whatever metal they had. They obviously aren't making, um, yeah, they can have people that lose their medals, lose their titles, lose all their sponsorships, so on and so forth. It's not hard to see, look at Marion Jones, look at the Balco uh, situation that happened years ago. You can obviously also, you know, look at what's happened to effectively Olympic weightlifting. 
And if you want a pretty good also reality of how it's, uh, it's really easy to pass a drug test if you know what you're doing, I would point you guys into watching the documentary Icarus uh, on Netflix. It's something, it's, it's a good kind of first pass into the reality of the double standards of how things are going with drug testing with athletes. So let's start talking about fun with drugs. So amphetamines, or what we're really talking about is sympathomimetics. Now, what these are going to do is obviously speed you up. So I'm sure some of you guys are familiar with ephedrine or pseudoephedrine, which is gonna help with obviously concentration, focus, energy, allow you to feel a little bit more energetic and typically is going to enhance performance and delay your fatigue, which is gonna be useful for all athletes. Now, one of the issues with it is this is pretty hard on your cardiovascular system. So like anything else, you can have some issues with cardiac stress and you probably have heard of examples of athletes who essentially collapsed and died from utilizing ephedrine or other very strong sympathomimetics. Mind you, you can just get a prescription for Vyvanse or Ritalin and that is much, it's a relative analog to this. Now, it does increase our power output and it will help a little bit with burning through more calories and reaction time for obviously a number of sports. Now, aside from the obvious stress on the body, you can have obviously addiction because we don't see, you know, it's, it's kind of sad to see all these Starbucks closing throughout the country, how every day there seems to be less coffee shops, you know, less people that are utilizing caffeine to get through their day. But that's in the same type of, uh, that is in the same family of substances that people may or may not abuse in order to enhance their own performance. And like anything else, it's the dose that makes the poison. So, and I will flat out tell you, I used ephedra in the early 2000s uh, when I was working as a clerk at the post office and that stuff is dynamite. Um, utilize that to keep from falling asleep when I was clerking from two in the morning till usually about 10 in the morning. And it's, yeah, it definitely had a lot of pop to it, but like anything else, you can find a number of easily, now mind you, this is availability heuristics, which is not a good way to do things based on like what you can find on Google. You Google anything, you're going to find some, maybe a wackadoo, maybe a good well-meaning person putting out information saying that this happened or that happened, but it has been tied to a number of high-level athletes essentially dying uh, because of abuse of things like ephedrine. This is also the classification we put cocaine, which was the pre-workout of choice of a number of athletes uh, specifically for competition uh, throughout time. Now, the next pharmacological agent is going to be beta blockers. Now, beta blockers are specifically given to people as a means to lower their blood pressure, which is a great thing. Also deal with anxiety and stage fright. So this is actually a utilized, abused, by a number of perf uh, performance musicians, people before they have to give speeches in public, and otherwise in order to bring their body down and not allow them to have that full fight or flight response because it essentially blocks epinephrine from working. So this is really useful in archery, rifle, and other accuracy-based sports because you literally are a lot calmer. So it's easier to keep your hand a lot steadier whenever you're having to be obviously trying to aim at something. Now, like anything else, you abuse this. There's a lot of negative potential outcomes. Obviously, low blood pressure being one of them, so you can have issues with dizziness passing out. And yes, you're not going to take this before you go do maximal lifting, play football, etc., because you're going to literally be too calm. Unless you're a kicker, that is where it might show some efficacy. Now, the next one we have is caffeine, which once again is another sympathomimetic. It just happens to be a lot weaker and is socially acceptable. Because remember, guys, all of the lines of this drug is illegal and this drug is legal are arbitrary lines that we have developed and codified in the laws. Sometimes based on not great arguments. If you guys would like to know more, feel free to have conversations with me about the illegalization campaign, or you can just look, up, look it up into how weed became illegal in the USA in the 1930s, 1940s. Let me tell you, it's a classy argument. Now, Caffeine is going to give you a lot of the same type of effects you're going to get from any of the same sympathomimetics. Just once again, your risk profile is a lot lower. Usually it seems to be about three milligrams of caffeine per three to six 
uh, milligrams of caffeine per kilogram of body mass tends to be the sweet spot where you're getting that positive effect of energy, but not you're, you're not so jittery that you're unable to focus, unable to uh, essentially not twitch too much. So it also helps with delivering free fatty acids into the bloodstream so you can utilize them better for aerobic training. In fact, about three cups of coffee for your average person would, meaning like a 150 odd pound person, would actually be considered to be illegal in uh, cross country, you know, Olympic uh, distance events because of having too much caffeine in your system. So arguably my boss would never, would always pop positive for caffeine and fail the drug test. Um, and obviously you guys probably know a lot of the people that utilize it uh, as a crutch to get through life. Um, now, the next component is gonna be with those diuretics. Diuretics are drugs that are going to specifically cause you to essentially pee more. So since you're filtering out more water on your bloodstream, it can be useful if we're trying to go ahead and cut weight for a competition. Also, this can be a way that we're gonna to able to effectively dilute out the other types of metabolites that are gonna be naturally occurring in your urine from taking other drugs that we're gonna talk about through here. So like anything else, this is something you need to be careful of because it's naturally dehydrating you. So it's going to have a negative effect on your aerobic system along with obviously having issues with your basic ability to thermoregulate. And you can obviously potentially die from their abuse. Uh, this is what a lot of uh, weight class athletes, MMA player, MMA fighters, uh, some power lifters and otherwise will use as a means to cut weight for their weigh-in and then immediately start eating and drinking to get that weight back on. Actually, a lot of them will use IV fluids to get the fluid back on that they just lost. And if you do it correctly, you'll be fine. If you do it wrong, you will die. But, you know, sometimes you got to make sacrifices for the swole. Then we've got our good old recreational drugs. So no ergogenic effects is full of shit. Cocaine is just a hell of a drug. A lot of people are going to utilize this once again to increase energy, aggression, and otherwise. Um, it's not un it's not very well held secret that a number of power lifters and strongmen, that was their pre-workout of the white powder they were sniffing before they went out on the on the platform to go make some weights because it really helps you get pumped. Marijuana obviously is a drug tested in competition because it tends to make you also be a little more relaxed and calm. I believe there was a snowboarder a, a couple of years ago because in theory it helps with creativity, which is actually useful for things like snowboarding. When we're talking about half pipe to perhaps be a little high while you're doing it because you're going to be a bit more relaxed and be able to flow a little bit more. Nicotine is actually a nootropic. It helps with concentration and energy. And like anything else, some folks are going to utilize it, not just smoking it or I guess vaping it now or the, um, the chewing tobacco, but some folks will actually use nicotine gum or um, patches as a means to actually help them whenever they're trying to go ahead and you know perform in one area or another. And alcohol, since it does have an ability to in, uh, cause disinhibition, it can have a little potential effects on performance, as long as obviously not too much of it is being utilized. So let's get to the main events, folks, and let's talk about the things that really, really work, which is going to be anabolic steroids. Now, anabolic steroids are the, or steroids is a class of hormone. This is going to be specifically analogs of testosterone. Now, this could be testosterone in itself or things that are very similar to it. So anabolic, meaning growing, androgenic, meaning causing secondary six characteristics. So as I just removed my mustache before I gave this presentation last night. So boy, didn't really time that out too well, did I? So the anabolic effects, building bone and muscles can be useful for pretty much everyone. And that's where we're SARMs, if they ever come to market in such a way that they really do help only that, and that can be the secondary sex characteristics, they're gonna be a great choice. Now, at the same time, they're gonna be androgenic. So now you're gonna carry on more male traits. So ladies, look at the type of facial hair that your dad has, and figure that you're going to start to look relatively similar to him when it comes to facial hair, as well as you can start to see changes in your total, um, yeah, not in changes in your voice and a couple other changes, which we can talk about those side effects if you guys are interested. But in reality, they definitely help increase lean body mass. So, and it tends to be tied to obviously the total amount of dosage that an individual is using. So the greater the dose, the greater amounts of overall lean mass, along with the loss of fat mass and allow you to effectively recover faster from your different essentially training sessions. So 
This is a simple study looking at the use of steroids compared to placebo. We can see changes in fat-free mass, arm growth, thigh growth, calf growth, leg strength, and arm strength through the use of those anabolics next to obviously individuals given placebo. However, the Basin et al. article, which is this guy right here, is the greatest example of effectively <clears throat> what happens when you give individual anabolics. So definitely increases lean mass, definitely decreases fat mass, and can definitely give some advantages to strength training. So in this study, the individuals were immediately divided into four groups. Effectively, the first way they divided them is they were either given a workout or no workout group. So this is the group that didn't work out at all. This is the group that did work out. Then within that, they divided up into one group got a placebo injection and one group got a testosterone injection. And the testosterone injection was kind of what a bodybuilder bro would take in each week, maybe a little bit on the low end of how much some of those folks would inject, but it was definitely you know, a therapeutic dose of testosterone. Now, <clears throat> this is where things get interesting. After training for eight weeks, notice the individuals who sat on the couch, didn't do anything, gained almost twice as much lean mass as the group that lifted weights the entire time without steroids. And the individuals that lifted weights while on steroid, steroids gained about four times as much lean mass. Look at the changes in tricep mass. Barely any for the group that lifted weights for all eight of those weeks. The dude sitting on the couch, just riding the roid pony in a swole town, gained a very significant amount of muscle mass and then training on top of it was obviously a little bit more. Now the quads, this is where it's a little bit more comparable, but still the couch potato gained, weight, gained more and the person lifting weights, we're talking about multiples of gains. Now the one way that training helps you over not training and doing steroids is you get stronger, mostly probably do that motor changes we talk about of recruitment patterns but they still didn't gain anywhere near as much strength as the individuals that were lifting weights and doing steroids. So overall, low doses are not really gonna give you much of an effect other than normalizing your uh, body's natural hormone levels. And obviously taking larger chronic doses are gonna be things that are effective. If you guys wanna have a in-person conversation about the use of anabolics um, and my thoughts towards them, um, we can always have that. Um, as far as like the application of it, at the end of the day, it's a personal decision. There obviously is a number of different risks along with you. If you're caught with these, you go to prison, uh, SARMs are selective androgen receptor modulators, and they seem to be effectively in that same cat and mouse game that pro hormones were a number of years ago, where really what they're doing is they're acting like testosterone in the body. Once you go ahead and take it in orally, though, it's very hard on your liver and they don't really seem to be that selective yet or that really efficacious that I would really suggest anyone really playing with them because uh, your risk, yeah, your, your side effect risks are typically much higher in SARMs and pro-hormones than they are in just actually doing anabolic steroids, which is kind of fascinating. And like anything else, it's the dose that makes the poison. But my personal philosophy is at the end of the day, if you haven't trained hard without the use of these substances for at least half a decade, you haven't earned the right to use them. You don't know how your body responds to training. You haven't had to figure out how to train. You haven't had to put in any of the real effort to get better. So until you've essentially crossed that threshold, I'm not having a conversation with you about how you do drugs, but obviously league minimum in the NFL, Major League Baseball, NBA is quite high. And if the difference between you being in those leagues and making that money is whether or not you choose to use these substances, that's a personal choice. And I'm going to hopefully help inform that individual as well as I can as to what are the pros and cons of the risks that they're taking. But like anything else, yeah, they work. And there's an ex governor of California that seems to be having a pretty good life. And he used what looks to be epic amounts of them at certain points in time. Um, as well as Stallone seems to be doing pretty well. And it seems like he's cycling on and off almost perpetually, but at the same time, 
It's personal choice. Now, what's also fascinating is the muscle mass increase. Yes, it, it seems to come along with obviously greater dosages. We're also increasing the activation of the satellite cells. So they're gonna to bind to our muscles. So now, remember we have more nucleation. So in theory, we're gonna have faster turnover and recovery. But this begs an interesting question, which is once someone's used anabolics, they've had this greater accretion of those essentially satellite cells increasing the myonuclei number. Remember, those don't go down the second you stop using anabolics. So there's an interesting debate worth having, which is after an athlete tests positive for drugs, technically, if you really care that much about fairness of sport and making sure that, you know, one thing never, we kept the playing field fair, which is an arbitrary concept and doesn't really exist in the first place, we would ban them for life because now they've actually changed themselves physiologically in such a way that they have an advantage over someone who's never done anabolics in the first place. So they also increase cardiorespiratory performance specifically by increasing our red blood cell production and our total blood, blood volume. Uh, this is one of the reasons why Lance Armstrong utilized testosterone, even though he didn't look like he ever lifted weights, much less obviously utilize those drugs because it does help with recovery. So we tend to have less fiber damage after really hard training. And this in turn is going to cause a greater amount of protein synthesis. So bigger muscles, they recover faster and that's gonna allow you to essentially do more work. Now, there's a number of different issues with the potential use of anabolic steroids. And we're really talking about abuse because there's a number of situations, wasting disease and otherwise, where it can be very useful to put people on a therapeutic dose of testosterone, which is very different than a pro bodybuilder you know, pro athlete uh, dosage. Now we have all of these wonderful potential risks that we can have suppression, of normal hormones, testicular abnormalities, we're really talking about shrinkage, um, excess estrogen. So you can get what's known as gynecomastia. You start to get breast development uh, for women. Now we've got a lot of things going on with uh, their normal hormonal production, along with obviously some masculinization of features. Now, the liver cancer comes from doing the oral anabolics, and I'm guessing I, I probably extend as much to SARMs and definitely for hormone use. And then prostate potentially also, because we have increase in PSA levels, but this is something to just be mindful of. And obviously issues with potentially cardiovascular problems, because now we're going to definitely have a decrease in HDL and increase in LDL. But on top of that, we can obviously have some issues with changes in overall heart function, and this is even more problematic when older gentlemen go on to uh, hormone replacement therapy in that you take a guy that, you know, was feeling very lethargic, not as energetic, having a hard time doing a lot of things in life. And then you put him on anabolics and now he feels energetic and excited and wants to go do things. And he's essentially just driving his very bad car harder than it's been driven in decades. And congratulations, you have a myocardial infarction. Um, if you're giving it to individuals, you know, slowly and you're stair-stepping their physical performance or physical training, they're going to be in yeah, relatively low risk categories. So there are the potential issues with aggression or roid rage. In reality, that seems to be more from like oral anabolics, like things like Anavar, which you guys want a funny story about that. Ask me about it in person. I'll be more than happy to tell you some of the drug use stories I've seen when I was competing um, in overheard of people making choices. Uh, obviously potential dependence because, you know, once you've built all that muscle and you have whatever aesthetic you're looking for performance, it'd be hard to let it go. And yes, if we're sharing needles, you're always going to have that risk. Decreased lifespan. Yes. If you're using large amounts of it, absolutely. Potential issues with birth defects. And as far as what's going on from the long-term effects, it's still not fully out there. However, I really do enjoy this wonderful uh, comic from a webcomic known as XKCD, uh, which I'll give you guys a moment to go ahead and read that. And hopefully you get the joke. And if you don't, let me know. I would be happy to break it down.
Yep, I have a little too much fun. But it's a personal choice. There are risks to it. It's obviously not fair if you're the person bringing a knife to a gunfight. I will be the first to admit that I have done competitions where literally the guys that beat me had back knee. You can see from across the room that, um, yeah, it's kind of funny. Some of the guys, like, they were talked about how clean they were, and then later they'd fail. They finally pop positive for drug tests, and that's after they kicked my teeth in a competition. I was like, oh, well, this is fun. So at the end of the day, personal choices. We're all human. We're all going to make our own. And at the same time, just being mindful of what are the major risks if you're utilizing, obviously, too much of any substance. Now, you guys maybe heard of androstenone dione or DHEA, and DHEA is actually more of a precursor. It's that it's one of the metabolic steps into creating not just testosterone, but also um, dihydroxytestosterone, DHT, and, I, and epitestosterone. But I think it also, no, it's, it's progesterone is before, and that's where we're getting into in pregnenolone, which will lead itself into potentially also estrogen. And DHEA can also go into cortisol. So these potentially, uh, andro seem to have a little bit of an effect on testosterone, but pro-hormones are going to be the much greater one. And this is something that you can still get kind of in a cat and mouse game of this goes on the, this product goes on the market, which can metabolize into testosterone, but it's like chlorinated and has some other major issues. So it, it's just, it's hard on your liver uh, for breaking that at, down. So then they'll take this substance and legalize it. So then we'll go to this substance that's hasn't been illegalized and we'll sell that. And then that'll get illegalized. And like I said, it's a cat and mouse game of one thing becomes illegal and then they move over to the next one. And that's the real problem because pro hormones used to be a lot safer. Uh, one AD, which was legal when I was in like high school, um, which is around 2000. So when you guys were being born um, and some of you guys obviously not even being born. And once they got into the first major pro hormone ban, which was in, oh gosh, that would have been like the late 2000s. And all of the really effective ones with low side effects became illegal. So the ones that weren't as effective with higher side effects were the ones they started selling and then those became illegal. So now the pro hormones, pro hormones they have left are the ones that don't have much effect and are real harsh on the body. And congratulations. It keeps on moving forward in a cat and mouse game. Now there's then the abuse of human growth hormone. So it's going to have positive effects on essentially turnover throughout the body. It's really interesting. It's going to even have positive effects on things like your vision and overall, um, yeah, like literally vision and, and visual acuity because we're literally helping improve the turnover all of our cells. Problem with it, aside from the chance of acromegaly, which is increasing the size of your hands and feet, which is going to be, it's going to be hard on your heart, can be potentially causing hypertension and actually leading itself into glucose intolerance, potentially causing diabetes. And that's why if you see or hear of like pro bodybuilders who you're utilizing not just testosterone, but growth hormone and insulin, that's because, well, thanks to the use of all that growth hormone, now they're having issues with insulin sensitivity. So now they got to take insulin. So that way they're going to be able to take up all that blood sugar, all, yeah, all the glucose they're putting into their blood and not running super high blood sugars. So uh, you probably heard of different scandals of pro athletes using uh, human growth hormone or growth peptides, some type of analog in order to enhance recovery. Like anything else, the goal there obviously is to enhance performance. It's not necessarily always going to give you that much of an increase in performance. Uh, most of the athletes that I've talked to that you've utilized them, it doesn't really seem to help that much with strength and performance, but if anything else, it just seems to help with allowing people to recover a little bit faster than they would have otherwise. So now we're going to talk about some physiological agents. So things that are going to occur naturally that we can use to enhance a performance. Now, what is fascinating is testosterone is a physiological agent because it's naturally occurring and we can utilize it. But at the same time, if we take more erythropoietin, we're going to increase our red blood cell count, increase our oxygen carrying capacity of the blood, and from there, quite possibly increase our overall aerobic performance. Now, blood doping is a fun thing because you're literally going to take a, like a 
you know, probably a, a pint of blood off yourself once or twice. And then you're going to inject it back into yourself effectively right before a major competition. And it's going to tend to add maybe somewhere between five, 10% of to your aerobic performance, because now we have a greater amount of available red blood cells for overall performance. And this is something that's utilized a lot in long distance athletes, specifically in people on the Tour de Drugs, Tour de France, Tour de France, sorry, um, where they're going to utilize blood doping as a means to increase the hematocrit, which gives you a better aerobic performance. And like anything else, when you're putting this blood back in you and you're supercharging yourself, you're also giving yourself some issues because it turns out now your hematocrit's higher, your blood is effectively thicker. And there's actually been, a, I think, one or two cases of individuals who competed in the Tour de France dying of heart failure because literally their blood was too thick and that took them out. Now, this seems to be even more useful when we're going into much greater distances. So when we're talking about people that are running a 5K, yeah, well, I mean, I, if we think about our cross-country kids here, I'm sure most of them would be pretty happy to overnight and especially if you're going to 8K, 10K, take, shave a minute off your 10K, that's pretty good. Whereas if you're doing it just because you're going to go run a mile, it's not really giving you those advantages. Now, like I said, it is going to be pretty hard on the body. You, you don't really want to be partaking in this unless you've got some major medical overlook. And that's what people like Lance Armstrong and others will utilize is have really good uh, medical coverage that are going to be effectively following them when they're using these substances, making sure none of their values are getting to the point where it's going to be literally risking their life. Now, erythropoietin, once again, that's that hormone that our kidneys are going to produce, telling our uh, bone marrow to produce more red blood cells. Like anything else, it's going to give us the same positive effects and the same negative effects, where now we can risk blood clots forming because we do have that much more viscous blood, which in turn is gonna be a bigger issue because when we're dealing with hormones, that's kind of long-term effects. Now, there are some ideas of trying to effectively give like pure oxygen supplementation in order to enhance performance. But yeah, if you do that while we're exercising, it can seemingly have a little bit of effect on your performance just because you're gonna have a little bit easier oxygen uptake. But overall, it, it, this is running O2 tanks the entire time, not really giving you an advantage. Now, sodium bicarbonate is actually a pretty useful uh, means to help with anaerobic style performance. Problem with sodium bicarbonate is if you do it too much all at once, it turns into being a very potent laxative and it can also cause a lot of GI upset. So you can do essentially smaller doses of sodium bicarbonate, which is literal baking soda throughout the day to help actually work as a buffer to keep from that blood um, pH level going down too quickly when you're doing very hard anaerobic work. So this is gonna be utilized in a number of athletes like someone running a four, 800 uh, swimming events that are of you know, moderate duration to actually increase performance. However, like anything else, do be mindful that um, yeah, the GI upset is no joke and it's something that should be practiced. And 300 milligrams per kilogram of body mass, guys, that's a lot, a lot, a lot of baking soda that you have to ingest. So it seems uh, more recent lit has been dividing it up in smaller doses doses in the days leading up to your uh, competition. It can give you about the same effect without the GI negative effects on performance. Um, yeah, I personally probably wouldn't play with it too much. Now, phosphate is going to, in theory, help a little bit with increasing the performance by giving us effectively more phosphate that can essentially bind and be used for replenishing ATP, phosphocreatine. However, it doesn't really seem to work. Uh, it doesn't really seem to have a lot of negative effects, but it does cost you money. There's a number of different amino acids with the idea of trying to supplement with to enhance performance. Maybe HMB helps a little bit with effectively increasing fat-free mass, but we're not quite completely sure. It's very useful in older individuals. And that's probably more of an issue of stopping all of the catabolic pathways that become seemingly more active as you get older. Um, otherwise, it doesn't really seem to be uh, that good of an agent. L-carnitine, remember, is gonna be used in that cat one, cat two transporter of getting fatty acids in the mitochondria. Doesn't really seem to have any of those effects, but it is a popular supplement and people will try it. Then there's creatine monohydrate, which really freaking works. 
Uh, it's going to not just increase the phosphocreatine uh, content in your muscle, but also in places like your nervous system. So it seemingly has effects on both short-term, uh, with enough loading, a consistent effects on performance. Do keep in mind when utilizing something like creatine. Creatine is something you need to take consistently. So taking just once has really no effect. You have to take it day in and day out. And then that's where you seem to have the greatest efficacy for it, along with if you literally eat, uh, if your average person eats about a pound and a half or so of red meat a day, they're getting so much creatine from the meat they're eating, they're effectively on creatine. That being said, most people don't really want to have to eat a pound and a half of red meat each day. And obviously that scales upwards and downwards depending on that body size you have. And it's especially if you are a vegetarian where creatine seems to have a greater effect. And there's even more research recently about positive effects on brain function and decreasing risk of things like concussion. So creatine is something that's going to potentially increase your performance, say, you know, up to two or 3%. So it's nothing massive, but two or 3% can be more than the difference between winning and losing in elite sports. And, you know, plus if you like picking things up and putting down anything that helps a little bit. Another one more recently that seems to have effects with buffering specifically inside the muscle is beta alanine. Beta alanine and histidine uh, combine in order to make what's known as carnosine, which carnosine is the buffer inside of muscles, and beta alanine is typically the rate limiter. So utilizing that can be a potentially positive things for people that are doing a lot of anaerobic style work. Do keep in mind that uh, beta alanine taken too much at once is going to cause paresthesia. It's kind of a pins and needles across the face. It's in a lot of pre-workouts, so people think it's working, and it's actually not causing any positive effects. It's like creatine where you need to take it frequently enough that you're going to effectively be able to top out those intramuscular carnosine levels. Now, a big problem when it comes to supplements is the fact that there's rarely gonna be third-party testing. This is something where individuals can effectively put whatever they want on the market. They're not always getting it tested. That's why you wanna make sure you look for places that are third-party tested along with, they're not always going to list how much they have each ingredient in there because it's the dose that makes the poison, but it's also the dose that makes the medicine. So when they say proprietary blend, you don't really know how much of what is going to be in each serving. So like anything, you want to go ahead, do your due diligence and make sure that you're getting in effectively adequate amounts of each of those nutrients that it is claiming that it has in there. Because there's a number of different supplements out there on the market that if you actually look at how much they have of X, Y, or Z, it's so low, it's never going to really have a major effect on performance. But, you know, depending on your goals and otherwise, looking into the use of different types of supplements and or supplementing with vitamins, minerals, different macronutrients in order to help with performance can be potentially very useful. But the key is context. The key is what's going on with a person's life that might have that nutritional hole that we're trying to now fill. So... I think that's the best job I've done going through anabolics without swearing a lot. So good, good on me, making some progress. Now, what questions do you guys have for me? Since obviously we ran through a lot of information here and like anything else, the goal is to make sure that you guys can apply this information. So do you guys have any questions about drug use, any supplements that you guys have seen recently that you're interested in? Um, my advice for all of you guys, if you just hear somebody's trying supplement X, Y, or Z and you want to quick and easy way to kind of do a little bit of fact checking is look up the website examine.com. That's a really good choice when it comes to looking into, okay, is there really literature out there showing its efficacy or is this something that, you know, people are trying to make it sound like really works, but in reality, it's just marketing because supplement companies are there to make money, not to make you healthier, not to help you make performance improvements. And most pre workouts, the only thing in there that really works is caffeine. And in reality, the only supplements that I really tell anybody to take would effectively be creatine, maybe. So what questions, comments, concerns do you guys have about ergogenics?
No questions, comments, concerns about drug use? Great question, Noah. Now, when it comes to creatine's usage and its effects on the kidneys, it's not really going to be that hard. If people have healthy kidneys, you should never be really, really worried about how much creatine someone's taking in unless it's just something absurd. You don't need to load creatine. It's just a good way to effectively go through more creatine much more quickly, which helps the company that sold it to you make more money. But in reality, just that three to five grams a day for most people is going to be more than adequate. Um, and it's not going to be that hard on your actual kidneys if we're effectively healthy in the first place. But if you have renal failure, yeah, don't take creatine and definitely diminish your protein, protein intake and be very mindful of your electrolyte. Whereas for, yeah, you guys, it's not really, your risk reward is very much so balanced towards reward in this situation. All right. What other questions do you guys have about ergogenics? <laughs> 